I have the Can everyone see? Is it is it still working so far? Perfect. Perfect. So I'll briefly um, talk a little bit about myself. I'm Nicholas. I'm from the United States. Um, I came about this this Gamba cadence research and, and curiosity. Um, it came from my my uh, curiosity and research in this Eisenstadt Estehasia court um, with Hammer, Liedel, Haydn. I find this music so great. And at some point, I was practicing some of these pieces and. I said, okay, well, this this one has a cadenza, this one doesn't. So I said, oh, how should I do this as gambists? We don't have the luxury of so many 18th century treatises in, in informing us of this. So then I said, well, what do the Abel manuscripts say? So I started looking at them, and then what does Lidl say? And then after a few minutes, I said, this is kind of like a catalog. And then it just kind of came from there. Um, so the purpose of this presentation, as well as the catalog, is to just to publicly display the condensed material to allow this wonderful Gamba community to become familiar with it. Uh, I hope that, that this talk, as well as the, the list, compiled the compilation of written slash notated slash non-improvised, it's not really a term for it, but these cadenzas, uh, I hope they will in, uh, assist others in terms of their own improvisation, composing, historically inspired cadenza writing uh, for their own personal use and performance. Oh, uh, and sorry, these in terms of these cadenzas on this title page, the first one on the top right is from a Lidl Sonata from the Maltzan collection. We will talk about it. The middle right is from uh, uh, Opus 2 of an Anton Kraft cello sonata. And the bottom right one, I will not tell you, but we will talk about it. So. We start with trying to define exactly what a cadenza is. Um, are there definitions? Are there overarching attributes we can describe to all of them? What's the difference between an improvised one and a non-improvised one? Is there always only one per movement? Um, a little foreshadowing, there is not. What's the difference between concerto cadenzas, sonata cadenzas? Uh, are they always on a 6-4 chord? Again, a little uh, foreshadowing. Um, What's the difference between instrumental cadenzas and operatic cadenzas? And straight off the bat, I'm going to say I can't answer all these questions. There's not enough time, and the tradition of cadenzaing is so rich, hundreds of years, centuries across different countries. It's really, really impossible to put a definition. And every definition I've seen, I've always been able to find an exception. And I'm only looking at I was a little bit narrowed in my focused in my what I've looked at. So that's to say that there's so many cadenzas uh, across other instruments, so many for oboe and violin and for keyboard instruments. Um, and then so many more that are, are not improvised that, of course, um, uh, ephemeral practices are so hard to study. Um, so instead of giving a definition of my own. We're going to briefly look at one or two uh, historical sources that attempt. Okay. So like any good uh, early music lecture, we start with a bit of quants. The Versuch einer Anweisung die Flöte Travisa zu spielen, or the English translation um, by Edward Riley on playing the flute. And chapter 15 of this is on cadenza writing. And I'm going to briefly talk about it. I recommend everyone looks at it and familiarizes themselves a bit. It's quite helpful. I think Quantz comes quite close to giving a definition. He says, which is at the bottom of the slide, the opposite der cadence. He uses the word cadence, which sources do in this time. There's historical, uh, so the two words cadenza and cadence come from the same root. But that's for another lecture. The Absicht der Cadenz is keine andere als die Zuhörer nach ein Mal vor dem Ende unvermutet zu überraschen und nach einer besonderen Einzug in ihrem Gemüte zurückzulassen, which is translated, I think, quite well into English as the object of the cadenza is simply to surprise the listener unexpectedly once more at the end of a piece and to leave behind a special impression in his heart. 
I have seen cadenzas. Uh, there are even gamba cadenzas that are not necessarily at the ends of pieces. For example, the one that we looked at at Kref that we just saw is not at the end. Um, but I think in terms of leaving a special impression, it's, it's a nice definition and it doesn't really help us so much. I think what's more useful is these two examples in, in figure 20. Uh, he gives us two cadenzas. These are from Quantz. This is in a modern edition. And in figure one, we have these uh, these rising figures of seven notes three times repeated. And it cascades down. It gets a little quicker. Um, the tessitura is, becomes the largest from the middle to the end. Um, and then, of course, there's a little cadential shake or a trill. Then it ends. It's quite straightforward. Um, it's not so harmonically explorative as some of the other things that we will look at. Um, he doesn't put a baseline, interestingly enough. Um, but he does, and of course the second cadenza is quite similar to me. It looks like a variation similarly uh, based on the first. Um, these are the only two examples he gives us. He gives us a few other points in chapter 15. I'm just, uh, of course, there's a lot of points that he gives us. I'm going to just quickly mention a few, and then we will move on. He says that there are, that cadenzas are only permissible in pathetic and slow movements, or in serious quick ones. Uh, he says, to me, controversially, that the cadenzas must stem from the principal sentiment of the piece and include a short repetition or imitation of the most pleasing phrases contained in it. That's point eight. He gives some guidance on dual cadenzas, cadenzas for two soloists. They strike me as almost like Fuchs uh, counterpoint exercises where one person will solo, hold a note, and then using kind of your ear and um, basic harmony, you would use uh, uh, imitation. Um, interesting. Um, I think at this point, we have to remind ourselves that this is written in 17 published in 1752, and Quance is a bit earlier than a lot of the other gamba and, and, and cadences we'll look at. So by this point in his life, he's over 50, he's working in Berlin with Frederick the Great, so he's quite successful, and I think in applying a lot of the things we said, it might be for the generation before, I mean at this point, the music he, he grew up playing and listening to when, when he was 20s, 30s, you know, influential uh, eight periods of his development so far removed. Um, so I, I'm not trying to diminish Quantz in any way. I'm just saying he's just a very successful, good musician. And not um, this isn't the Bible. Um, he he. Interesting. One one interesting thing that he says is he refers to the need for speedy invention, and. To me, he implies the speedy talk of speedy invention and knowledge of counterpoint really stems away from prepared cadences and cadences that are written um, completely on the side where we would expect someone like Abel to be of who have these rep uh, reputations of being amazing virtual so improvisers. Quantz doesn't really give us information on prepared cadences or um, but there's another source that I'll quickly talk about. Um, there's an autobiography of Karl Ditters von Dittersdorf, and I'm using the English translation by Coleridge from 1896. If anyone is interested, I have it as a PDF and I'm happy to share. And there are just two small little anecdotes that um, Dittersdorf mentions. I guess they're not anecdotes, they're just personal uh, life events. Um, so this, this was written at right when he was on his last year or so of his last year of being alive, his last year of life, so around 1798. So this is 40 years after after Quantz is published. Um, the first thing is page 44 of this translation, and he talks about, <laughs> for a few pages, he goes on about complaining how no one knows how to write a cadenza anymore, and this this practice isn't as good as it used to be, and it's to me it strikes me very much as uh, just kind of an old fuddy-duddy complaining that you know things aren't like they were when I was young. Um, but on page fifty-two, which more a little more uh, applicable, 
he says in an anecdote, or not an anecdote again, he says he would go from from when he was about 17, 18, he was, as part of his studying, would practice cadenzas in all the major and minor keys. Um, and he would also practice his solos and cadenzas by, he would break his top string and play his cadenzas with just, without the, the top E string on his violin, on his violin. And just his, I think it was a accidentally breaking the string. It's quite interesting I, as a showman thing, but it's interesting because these cadenzas lie not as, they're kind of in between where they're not truly improvised, but they are um, prepared in some degree, but with an improvisatory nature, it's, it's again, hard to define exactly where they are. Moving right along, we will look at the last source before we dive into the gamba cadences, and this is 64 cadences or solos for the violin in all the major and minor keys composed by Luigi Borgi. Um, again, the word cadence, and so this this was Borgi came from Italy, of course. Uh, we don't really know so much. His life has not been so researched from what I found. And I've seen this published. This was obviously published after that. I've seen someone put the date 1790, but it seems to me that all those all the sources that put that link it to one modern source that um, I've never seen a primary document saying this is from then, but it's from at least the 1770s. And it's an interesting work because it's this is really this is quite the Bible of um, cadence writing uh, or how to perform cadences. And it's really written with a pedagogical uh, intent. Um, and it shows quite a few distinctions from Kwan's. Uh, firstly, um, if you look at the first I have just the first five. Of course, this is also available on IMSLP, free to download, and I recommend looking at it. Um, the first of the first five, only number three is an andante, and the first, the other four are allegros. So, of 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 where where Quantz talked about slow movements, we see here or serious ones. I mean, four allegros. I mean, they're probably not. Um, so serious. They're also f really for amateurs, so we have to ask ourselves, are these amateurs playing cadenza, or sorry, are these cadenzas they're playing in sonatas or concertos? I won't speculate, uh, I have my opinions. Um, and it's interesting to me how removed they are. These are not with any attached to any pieces, they're just the cadenzas. So by definition, they're not tied to the principle of principal ideas of any any piece. So maybe it could be the personal preference of Borgi versus Quantz, maybe it's development over time, different places. It's very, very difficult to say, but here, these are standalone cadenzas. You can, I mean, theoretically, an allegro in C, this could be the cadenza that you are, or your cadenza would be inspired by, by this sort of material, where Quantz, to Quantz, it's improvisatory based on the the actual piece you're playing. So because I like these pieces so much, I'm going to attempt to to play a recording of one. I'm hoping that I can get this to work. I'm quite nervous for this. Okay, it didn't work. I know why though. I forgot to click the share screen, share sound button. Okay, I'm going to try again. So we can see they're, they're, to me, more exciting, but they're more, 
explorative tonally a little longer than Quant's. Um, but they're worth reading through, and I think they're very, not just to violence, and not just to apertures for all of us. They've helped me so much um, in my own development and, and, and playing. And they're quite nice. Oh, and of course, that was Eric Schroeder on the violin playing that cadenza. So, without further ado, we will look at gamba cadenzas, like I promised. So, the... So the catalog that I have compiled is hosted on the Violinet website, which, as far as as I uh, learned, I I wasn't here for the beginning of Violinet, but I I moved to Salzburg, and I was part of it from the second or third year. It's a really really wonderful collaboration. It's really a a melting pot of of the research between different different universities, and it's as I've been told and experienced, the brainchild of Bettina Hoffman. So everyone should use this resource. I use it a lot. Um, it's great, and I'm happy to have my tiny little place in it under sheet music, extant gamba cadenzas. Oh, sorry, extant cadenzas for the viola de gamba. So thank you very much, Bettina, for, for all your help and everything. It's really, really great. But so before we look at the list, there are two very quick or moderately long disclaimers. Uh, I want to just firstly say it's a living document and it's constantly being updated. We will actually look at four cadenzas of Abel that are not yet on the list, uh, but they're really gorgeous, really interesting, and they can help inform us a lot. But some some manuscripts, for example, the the Abel ones from the Pembroke that I'm talking about now, they were in a private collection. Some manuscripts are in Hungary and have not yet not yet been digitized. Some of them are in are in France and it costs money to to be digitized and to to, to be sent. It's a slow process. Um, also, some sometimes I just miss one. Um, so please contact me if I've missed one. I will humble. It hurts my ego slightly to be honest that I've made a blunder in my research, but it makes me infinitely more happy that the list grows and there are more cadences. Um, uh, and then the second is that at the bottom we have Haydn, and these are baritone cadenzas, which I treat as, I include as gamba cadenzas for two, there are two historical precedents that I, that have influenced my decision. Firstly, Nicholas I of Esterhazy, uh in 1765, writes a letter to Haydn, and he refers to his baritone as my viola de gamba. He says, you need to please, he's being a bit harsh with Haydn, or reprimanding, I guess is the better word. He says, um, uh, you need to write something along the lines of, you need to write more pieces for my, up, so I can play upon my viola de gamba, or viola de gamba, uses the word gamba, which is interestingly, interesting that the words can be uh, interchanged, that he would use not the word baritone, but gamba. And there's another manuscript in Franz Xavier Hama's hand that we will discuss later that on the title page says Sonata or, or Trio, or, or the title has the word Vila de Gamba. Then inside on the part for the Gamba part, it says Viola Baritone or Viola de Gamba. And so for a lot of these pieces that don't, it, it, sorry, if anyone doesn't know what a baritone is, it is a gamba. It has the, the top six and or occasionally a seventh string like a gamba with synth or, or metal strings that you can pluck with your thumb to self accompany me self accompany it's a very gorgeous instrument but some of the repertoire like the fiala trios in hamasan that i mentioned and the um a lot of the haydn baritone trios that don't use this plucking are completely playable on gamba you don't you wouldn't miss anything therefore these three examples of cadenzas i found fall into that category and so i put them so let's quickly look at let's let's look at how the list works uh, my my goal was to make it as user friendly. So you would just start with Abel is at the top. You could see this is a, a sonata for Vila de Gamba as it appears in the manuscript. Uh, modernized title name. The Maltan collection is where it's from, in Poland. Um, this is the the for identifying it in the library. The manuscript number, the page, the page in the manuscript, of course. And you just click, and you get a really nice, pretty 
um, image that could enter. And if you click under Catalog Hoffman, you can see it takes you to the, when possible, to the manuscript. And so you can then find, okay, it's on page whatever it was, 76, find the page, play the piece yourself, or see it in context if you so desire. Um, then, so, so th these are, all these are from the Maltzan collection and also the first Lidl, and I'll quickly talk about that if anyone, just in case anyone doesn't know about the collection where these are from. They were discovered in 2018. Um, I learned about them in a master, ar master arbeit, a master's thesis by Sonia Barankowska. Um, I believe, I don't know if she's the one who found them. She, her name was on the master arbeit who wrote it, so she obviously had a big role in it. I'm not exactly sure. Um, the master arbeit, she's very friendly. I've, I've corresponded with her and she's very, very nice. Um, but these works, there's about 20, 23 gamba solo pieces. It depends if you count uh, duels for cello or uh, there's some JC Bach obligato pieces. About seven, but so give or take 20 to 23. Seven of them have written cadenzas. They're in three different hands. Um, we don't know exactly who would have played them when they left England. They left England when Abel died in 1787. So it was either 1787 or 1788. They went to Poland. We're not exactly sure. Um, the the dipl a diplomat from the Monson family took them. We don't know who would have been the Gamas to play them in Poland with certainty. But there is a huge, huge uh, uh, amount of eight, not a huge, there's a large amount of 18th century, sorry, 19th century. Yeah, 19th century, uh, excuse me, um, gamba music from, from this Maltzan family. And I would recommend Thomas Fritsch has a beautiful CD called the 19th century Vial de Gamba, where he's recorded a lot of this Maltzan music and this 19th century gamba music really in 19th century theme and variations and, and lida for gamba, arranged for gamba. Gorgeous, gorgeous music played played very well and very good CD. I recommend it. Um, but that's that's the Maltzan in a nutshell. And like I said, this first Lidl is from there and the, the first, um, this first collection of Abel. So we will briefly leave the catalog go back to talk a little bit more about Abel. Uh, it's, I think, very helpful. We don't have so many uh, resources in terms of cadenzas to, I mean, seven is not a ton to base, to base uh, our studies off of, and they're in different hands, and there's so many more questions. Who did he write them for? If Abel's such a great improviser, why would he write out his cadenzas, or are they didactic? I, I, I won't give any of my um, inferences or the, my beliefs. I'm just simply providing the manuscripts and allowing everyone to make their own informed, historically informed uh, decisions and beliefs. But this sonata, cello sonata is um, quite nice. This is of course by Abel. I think it's interesting that he writes cadenza ad lib. I don't know how you can ad lib it seems to me to write it out is the opposite of ad lib. I don't quite understand what he means. And this flarinetto at the end, uh, I also, I think it's coming from like a flageolet, like a, um, from, from the French meaning arpeggio. That's what my personal correspondence with Celeste, the cellist who will play in the rest of the recordings we listen to. Um, but it's the open A string of the cello, so it could be done with harmonics. Um, I've also heard that flarinetto is a strange term, meaning like an, a tiny <clears throat> recorder-like instrument, but I don't know. Uh, this is from the second movement, it's an uh, adagio, and the manuscript is available online in the Stadtbibliothek Berlin. If someone has trouble finding it, I have it as a PDF and I'm happy to share it if you um, <clears throat> inquire or can find it online. So a little more Abel. These are from the, the cello concerto in C. The manuscripts are also in the Stadtbibliothek. 
Um, this first one is from the Allegro Maestoso. Uh, it is, it's interesting to me, um, it's measured. So a lot of definitions I've seen of, of cadenzas talk about being unmeasured. And this is, this is not so. Um, it is, of course, an, uh, an exception and a rarity, but they do exist, um, I suppose. So this is from, again, this manuscript is in the, the Stadtbibliothek Berlin, available online. And we have from the second movement, Adagio Manantropo, again from the cello concerto. Um, I really love these four note chords that Abel writes with this, this uh, D flat. I, I always, I wonder to myself, as Abel also played cello and uh, five string pentachord, um, you know, who, who he must have been a bit creative when he was um, writing these and then, you know, not only gambas, more than gambas can play, play big four note chords so it seems, um, but they're quite nice. I think it's important to supplement as kind of, as a, as a supplement, we don't have enough gamba cadenzas to strictly look at them. So to consider the, the gamba cadenz, the, sorry, the cadenzas of gambists who also played other instruments can help us inform ourselves of their gamba cadenzas. Um, also the colleagues of Gombists, I think it could be quite helpful. For example, Anton Kraft, if we briefly go back to the beginning, this cadenza that we looked at, the middle one, for, first of all, it's not on a 6 4 chord. Um, it's on an A major chord with a big arpeggio. And one might look at the piece and say, okay, um, what key is this in? It's probably in some sort of D with, with A being the dominant. But it's actually in F major. And after the serpeggio, what's not shown is that the, 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 it, this section ends and it goes directly to the recap of the theme. It's a slow movement and it's in F major. And it's so striking and it's, it's to me really experimental. I personally don't think it sounds, I don't like the way it sounds, but it's so innovative and forward thinking and creative and it's shocking to hear and I think I'm sure it could be played in such a convincing way. I cannot, um, but but it's I bring this up because Kraft was colleagues. He was also in in um, a colleague of Haydn in this Eisenstadt Esterhazy world. So he was living living in the same cultural bubble there. Um, also, the music of Sperger, for example. Sperger was a colleague of of Franz Xavier Hama, uh, twice first in in Pressburg and then in Ludwigslust, and there's a of Sperger. There's three three cadenzas that I think are really really interesting. They're from the Von Hall Bass Concerto, and all three quote the main theme, which I find happens a lot less often than something than reading Quans would uh, lead one to believe. So those are, those are adjacent cadenzas, which I think are really, really interesting and quite helpful. So we go forward with Abel, just quickly, these easy sonatas. Um, it's to me a bit Telemann-esque or Boismotier, where it's for gamba or harpsichord or violin or flute. If you can play an instrument that has a melody, you can play these. They're for you. They're published in 1771 in Amsterdam. No cadenzas, of course. They're not really in that vein. So next we have the Drexel manuscript, which is currently in New York. Um, there are about 25, maybe 27 solo gamba pieces. Um, and then there's some, in the back of the manuscript, there are some Corelli sonatas and some harpsichord pieces or, or tessitur instrument pieces. I didn't consider any of them cadenzas. I think they're beautiful, some of my favorite works, and they're definitely, we know of how spontaneous the improvisations of Abel were. Um, although I think they're not in the, in, in the intent, the intent of the pieces is not to be cadenzas. 
I think they just share this improvisatory nature that Abba was very fond of. Um, but um, I didn't, I didn't, I, I, it's difficult to draw the line, for example, in, in, in a rondo or minuet, when you have it like an angang or something that leads back into the theme of a minuet, where, what is a cadenza and what is not. So it's, it's a difficult question to ask ourselves. I didn't consider, for example, in a rondo, like I, like I had just said, uh, with these twirls that lead into to repetitions, I didn't consider them. Um, but a, a very quick anecdote about this. Uh, this was the first manuscript I've ever visited, and it was right across the street in the New York Public Library from where I was living. Um, and I had no no idea what I was doing. Um, and I, I went to the library. I, I didn't make an appointment. I just went to the library. And I said, you know, can I see the Drexel manuscript? And the the, the librarian said, um, okay, you can only view the the microfilm. It's in a room. I'll go take you there. And then uh, we got there, and the the librarian who had the key to get the microfilm was sick or wasn't there. And the librarian she said, I don't I don't know what to do. And so she just shrugged and she said, okay, I'll give you the book. And she just let me look at the actual book, and it was. 100% beginner's luck. I will say I have never had something work so smoothly or been so lucky in my entire life from that moment. So beginner's luck is 100% confirmed. Now we're on the Pembroke manuscripts. So these are in the British Library. And there are in this in this grouping, no cadences. Um, on the website, the, the British Library divides them into two books, um, but there are two collections. So there's this Pembroke collection, which is in England, and there's another one, which I will talk about after. But this, the, the first Pembroke collection um, has no cadences. There are, I want to say there aren't any formatas uh, for a 6-4 chord where you could improvise a cadenza. Maybe there's one, and I don't remember, but there's very, very few places to even put in a cadenza, which to me at the time made sense. I was thinking if these are four more amateur type pieces, um, I mean, there are fingerings in some of them. Maybe the, the, the player, Lady Pembroke, or, or um, Thomas Cheeseman, or, or um, Gainsborough, wasn't so interested in the difficulties of cadenza playing. So. I was very satisfied with that, um, except that I had moved on. Excuse me. But there are, are actually cadenzas in the in the Pembroke collection. Um, Thomas Fritsch, who I'm very thankful for his help, had sent me a email maybe a week ago saying, "Actually, Nick, there is a um, there's two collections, and the second part of Pembroke." is called the Colocundis, which is the surname of the private owner. Well, I guess now not so private, but the person who owns the um, these manuscripts. They're available to view digitally in Leipzig, in the, the Bach archive. Um, and before every, anyone freaks out and calls the police, I have permission to share these. Very, very luckily, very, very thankful to do it. I'm allowed to put these works on uh, the catalog and to share them with you for my, and uh, to use them in my, my studies, my, my um, musicological endeavors. Um, I think this this one on the bottom on the on the left is and when I put it when it's on the catalog, it will be nice and clear with the um, easy to find, navigate, and labeled. This this one on the left is from the third sonata it's interesting to me because we can of course there are fingerings which which i will speculate which i encourage everyone to do it was done as a didactic oh, sorry pedagogical tool for abel with maybe lady pembroke or whoever was playing this and it's interesting because we can actually see some of his fingerings and for example this uh, A sharp to B, he would take on the third string, or 
He would take the A sharp, we know at least. I would then imagine the fourth finger for the B. I, I invite everyone to play through these cadenzas. Um, unfortunately, this is just a sneak peek. The VIP Gamba Society uh, teaser, they are not yet on the catalog. They will be, so do not worry. Um, but they are really, really interesting, and we get a more intimate look at Abel as a, as a pedagogue. Um, and they're just gorgeous. They're just so fantastically written, just in terms of the penmanship. And some of the Maltzan um, sonatas, if you look through the catalog, I don't know, I think it's a third hand. It's very, I won't say what it is, but it's not so easy to read. It's not so nice on the eyes. Interestingly, this third sonata, um, so both of these, I'm sorry, the one on the right is the eighth sonata. Of course, they're both just titled Adagio. So they're both, these are middle movements of the three sonatas. Um, both of these, this is number three on the left, number eight on the right, number three, all three movements, the Moderato, Adagio, and Tempo di Minuet are in E major. In sonata eight, the Moderato, Adagio, and Minuet are all in F major. So he doesn't move to the dominant or, or the subdominant or the relative minor for the the um, inner movements, he stays in the tonic, which struck me as odd. I don't know of that as a practice, but it seems unusual. But in these two sonatas, it happens. We have luckily, thankfully, two more truly beautiful sonatas or, or cadenzas. Sonatas, movements of sonatas with cadences, I should say. Um, this is number nine, the G major sonata, and number 10, the D major sonata. Um, they're really, really gorgeous. I invite everyone to play through them as soon as they're on the catalog, um, which they will be hopefully very, very soon. Okay, so we move on to Beetle. Uh, like I said, the first C major is on the Mozart collection. These f next three are from an anonymous copy in France. They're also available on the um, BNF, the National French Library, their website, you could find them. Um, they're in Altoclef, which a lot of the other works that we looked at are in treble. I think these, the Haydn's are in Altoclef, the, the three Haydn baritone trios. And these, this copy is um, just an interesting, where we are in the history of the gamba, it starts to be a lot more treble clef friendly. And I'm going to just show this C major cadenza because this writing to me, it is so similar to the Haydn cadenza, which spoiler, we will listen to later. And just from, from the start of this cadenza, it's, you have this ornamented F with a little, mm, Kind of niceties, then a D with the niceties, a C, the niceties. You have this line, then B, B flat, A. Here's another thing. It's interest most often in terms of accidentals. It's what's it's hard to, hard to say, but it you wouldn't see A sharp, B flat. You wouldn't see a G flat, F sharp, regardless of which way it's functioning. If it's going sharper or flatter. So you would more like I in my what I've seen, and I think if you look at the cadenza catalog, you will come to the same conclusion. You would see A B flat B natural or B B flat A natural. In terms of accidentals, it's just what's easier for the for the mind. But this one to me, when we listen to the Haydn, it's so strikingly similar in terms of style. It could just be. Sightface, the spirit of the times, that the writing is similar, and I'm reading into it too much, but how could you how could you work with Haydn and not be influenced by him to some degree? Uh, and sorry, the the last thing I wanted to say, interestingly, of of Lidl, Lidl very often uses this trill trill trill, which is a common uh, cadenza figure, but he uses it often. For example, this last one, this one uses it. I think the G minor is the only one that doesn't. This one uses it. So maybe it's something when we are all improvising our own cadenzas, it's a common figure, at least in the music of Lidl. 
Okay, we move on to the Andres Lidl slash Hama portion, and let's take a deep breath. It's going to get a bit complicated and a bit confusing. So we'll go back to the slide. Okay, Hama was born in 1741. I should have mentioned Lidl was born in 1740 and died in 1789. Hama was born in 1741 and died in 1817. So they're about the same age. Um, and Hama was born near in Uttigen in Bayern, which is near Munich. Um, and in seven, his first real notable uh, position was in Eisenstadt, in the Esterhazy court where Haydn worked. And I forgot to mention, but I should have, so shame on me, is Lidl was in the Esterhazy court from 1769 to 1774. When he, when he finished, when he was dismissed, left Esterhazia, he toured Europe a bit, settled in London, or sorry, in England, I believe it was London, and had continental tours, but was based in, in England. Hama, so they, they're concurrent by a few years that, that um, Hama and Lidl were colleagues in, in Esterhazia. In 17, once Hama leaves in 1779, he goes to Pressburg, what is now um, Bratislava. And in 1785, he goes to Ludwigslust. Hama was colleagues with Sperger in, in um, modern day Bratislava and also eventually in Ludwigslust. So there's a connection um, there. Hama was a cellist and gambist. Pictured on the right is his actual gamba. It's a Stadelman, gorgeous instrument. You cannot play it. I could not play it as much as I begged and pleaded. It's in Schwerin, in a very beautiful glass case in the Landesbibliothek. It is not allowed to be played, <laughs> unfortunately, but you can look at it. Um, and it's pictured with a bow, that's a violin bow. And we know this because of the weight and it was worn, it's, you can view it, it's worn away uh, where you would hold a violin bow overhand, not an underhand. The two conclusions you could draw are that maybe Hama used a, a very light violin bow, but as a cellist, maybe, or I, what I think more likely is when the instruments were moved from Ludwiglust, where the court was, to Schwerin, when the state acquired the, 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 um, the, assets or the, 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 or the material, in moving, a bow got switched, which is possible. So we don't really know. I don't, I won't say what I think, but those are the facts. That's a problem, a very light, probably a violin bow. In, in Eisenstadt, sorry, in Schwerin, there are manuscripts, 2285 is a collection of five sonatas, one, two, three, four, and five. That has no, those numbers are arbitrary. They're just not related to, to the dates. They're just put on there for uh, organizational purposes. And 22851, which I have a screenshot of the portion of in the bottom left of this slide, is a sonata of Hammer. He writes Dame, meaning of or by. Um, when I first saw this, I went down a a borderline conspiracy theory rabbit hole that it was from his daughter and I was so excited it's the daughter who wrote the music but then someone said no <laughs> that's not French it's Italian um so he signs in this one this is a work by me in manuscript 22852 as well as 22854 which we can see in the top left it just says sonata in D Avilo de Gamba con violoncello um, it's difficult because in 22852, the first movement and the third movement correspond, they're, they're, they're Lidl sonatas copied out. They're slightly different, but these are the sonatas that we have in Paris. Um, it's from the first sonata, 22852, it's from Sonata 1 in the Paris collection. And the, I mean, it's, it's the same piece. I mean, it's slightly different in places, but it's the same piece. The difficulty is the second movement is not the same. It's different. Um, 
that's to say we don't know did Hama compose it maybe he copied it from somewhere else maybe Lidl wrote that too who knows it's in Hama's hand we know that but as to who authored this um, these two sonatas it should say Andres Lidl maybe Hama maybe Fiala maybe who knows I it's very very at this point I can't confidently say it's in Hama's hand and these works historically two two eight five um sorry two and four were uh, i'm sorry and then we have um two two eight five three the bottom right we have this other other gamba sonata that we know is by hama um he spells sonata differently he signed it 1786 which if anyone remembers is about 10 years uh, after he's working with with um, Lidl, so these are definitely written after. Um, maybe he I don't know had a bad day, forgot how to spell sonata, or maybe he summoned his Bavarian. I don't I don't know I don't know where that spelling comes from. He also spells digamba with D I again I don't know, but he he signs it Dame Hama and he puts six seven eighty six as the date. So we know these two are of Hama, and they're also so stylistic, stylistically different. They're in five movement, four or five movement, I forget. Um, they're not in the sonata form of fast to slow, a minuet or rondo. The, cop the copied ones are. So they're just so stylistically different, if anyone doesn't know these pieces. Um, they're, they're Hama's, these, these two manuscripts in the bottom are Hama's. Th these manuscripts are all on I must be, these five sonatas. Um, they're some of my favorite works. I know I've been saying that all night, but I, I get to talk about my favorite works. So I I'm sorry, but I, I, all these are my favorite. These are my favorite of my favorite. Um, it's it's what's added to the confusion of the authorship of these manuscripts is this on the bottom right. You say this a hama. You can see this hama x on the top left. And you could see something that Clemens Meyer, who was a librarian in Schwerin before before the, the current who just re retired, Dr. Proloff, is I don't know that I don't know if they, they haven't replaced him yet, but before that, or maybe two before that was Clemens Meyer, uh, as, as I think, uh, as I as I remember. Um, but this A Hama, it's difficult to see on the screen, but if you actually hold the manuscripts, this was not written by Hama. And if someone is astute, they can see that the spelling of Hama is different. In the bottom left and the bottom right, Hama uses this line over the M. Um, instead of a doppel M, here someone writes A Hama. And this Hama X, again, is not spelled how he would sign his name. And the handwriting is also just different. It's different ink. It's clear, if you look at it, it's clearly not. Maybe you can see on your screen. I couldn't. Um, this A Hama is thought to stand for arrangiert, meaning arranged by Hama. I think it might actually be a misattribution to maybe an Anton Hama, or in my less likely but hopeful uh, thinking, can't zoom in on it. Oh, you can. To me, I think it might be an FX, maybe some sort of insignia. Insignia, excuse me. Um, but in a way, it's a it's a moot point. It wasn't written by Hama himself. He didn't claim these pieces. So, in terms of authorship, who knows? <laughs> a very long way to say, sorry, I don't know. But we can still enjoy them and listen to one of them. Okay. I want play it from the beginning.
So now we am I muted? No. We now very quickly move to Fiala. Um, this is an interesting concerto. It also is in concertino, excuse me. It's also in Hama's hand in Schwerin. It only survives because Hama. That's the only copy we have of it. So thank you, Hama. Fiala was born in 1748 and died in 1816. Hama outlived him by one year. Um, Fiala was an oboist, gambist, cellist. I will skip some of his bio information because we're talking too much and running out of time, unfortunately. The interesting thing, besides being one of my other favorite, favorite cadenzas, is if we look at the gamba part, okay, it's in D, it's, it's what we could expect to see. If we look at the cello part, uh, it's what we can expect to see until the cello starts playing along and getting into the action, and instead of just having the six four the 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 base of the chord and the resolution has a little bit to do, um, and then we look at the violin part and uh, we've stumbled upon the first polytonal gamba cadenza. No, it's most likely a scottatura. Um, probably the gambist and cellist tuned up. We know that because also there's a copy of later that someone else made with it parts for the cello in E flat. So then the violin and viola would play, uh, sorry, the violin and cello would play in E flat. The gamba would score the tour up. So you can join me in my next lecture. Um, score the tour tuning, not just that annoying thing that stops us all from playing uh, amazing English lyrophile music. And in our recording, I will admit, because of logistics, we didn't, I played, uh, we just didn't do this tuning up. Uh, the only note it disrupts is where my mouse is circling. You cannot play that note on a violin. If you transpose it down, it goes below the range of the instrument. But hopefully no one would have noticed anyway. So we will look at this score. And oh. So for ground, I won't really talk too much. Uh, if anyone is interested in ground, I recommend the Michael O'Loughlin's, sorry, I recommend Michael O'Loughlin's book, Frederick the Great and His Musicians, the Viola de Gamba Music of the Berlin School. Ground, Hesse, the, the collection is very, very well documented. Nothing I can say <laughs> is not in that book. And for time, we will move on to Haydn very, very quickly. So, of course, it's with great sadness that this Haydn list is only three, three cadences long. When Haydn had 100, over 120 trios for baritone, viola, cello, and three concertos for baritone written, which are unfortunately lost or not known now. There's a violone, double bass concerto, again, lost, where, whereabouts are lost. Seven divertimentos, two of which we know we we have five. We don't really know. Um, so there's, in my belief, there's a lot more music that will be found, and hopefully, cadenzas in those pieces um, to go along with them. There, the difficulty in 
in studying these manuscripts is so many of them are spread out. There are some in Brussels, there are some in Washington, D.C., there are some in Budapest in Hungary. And, for example, the ones in Budapest haven't been digitized, and it's quite expensive to visit or to have them digitized. So it slows down the process, unfortunately, but I'm uh, going along as, as, as quickly as I can. Um, there are also works of, for example, Kraft, Anton Kraft, who I mentioned, has a trio for two barit or maybe it's a duo, two baritones and a cello. I don't know how he titles it, but there, and, and most likely more, there are works of Neumann, uh, Neumann, excuse me, Bergsteiner. There's a lot more baritone works. And hopefully, in addition to the very nice music, cadenzas. Um, on to the actual cadenzas. They are quite beautiful. They're interesting because they share a strong similarity with the uh, Abel cadenzas in that they are not written for a virtuoso. Um, they're written for Nicholas Esterhazy, who was the patron of Haydn and all these other uh, Hama and, and Beetle, for example. Very, very influential political figure and historical figure. Um, but these cadenzas are not, as we'll see, they're not as uh, demanding as some of the other ones in terms of what the, the for example, Lidl or, or Hama or Fiala, um, the ground one also. Ah, just the only thing I, I will say about the ground, uh, which I forgot, he really follows this holding holding of a note imitative counterpoint. This is for a dual concert for violin and, and um, this, sorry, this is the gamba line, this is the violin line. And interestingly, he was in Berlin, Hesse, Hesse and, and, and um, Ground were in Berlin, um, colleagues of, of, of Quantz. So m maybe Quantz was giving them a nudge and, and saying, well, I think your cadenza should have this kind of species counterpoint. Anyway, back to Haydn. Um, I think we'll listen to, 37 is the one we'll listen to, and oh, like I mentioned, um, this this line of, you could see this, this is Ray, sorry, D, B, A, G. Am I missing a, D, B, A, G, I'm missing a note. Well, then it gets to an E, anyway. Oh, no, this is an F. Regardless, I'm, 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 oh, D, B, no, either way, um, you can hear this line, uh, similar to, to, to what we looked at in this Lidl, which we'll look at one more time very quickly, this line with these decorative notes, um, and we will listen to this baritone trio to end I would like to do it. So I misspoke. This is in treble clef. The baritones are are, are, are trios are in treble clef for the gamba part. The first note is a C, which is why I couldn't make sense of it. Um, and that was Luke Chelliner on the baritone, with Eric again, who played the the, the Borgi and um, Celeste. So I would like to thank everyone for for listening to me, and I 
hope everyone is as inspired by these cadenzas and can um, use them for their own cadenza writing uh, and playing and, and, and study and to use these resources and I hope they're helpful for everyone in the comic community. Great, thank you very much. I think we've got plenty of time for questions. So if, any, if anyone has any comments or questions, this is probably a good moment. Just need to unmute yourself if you have any, anything to say. Yeah. Uh, maybe, can I? I ask course, Bettina, please. Yes, do you hear? Uh, first of all, thanks to Nicholas. Uh, for this research and for the uh, offering it to Violanet and for this speech. And um, only one thought, uh, you, you briefly uh, spoke about the question, uh, sonata and concerto. So what is, uh, as we saw, the, the most uh, used place, most you, you found is in uh, sonatas. And uh, I, I think we uh, should uh, change our idea of concerto uguale, uh, 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 is uh, equal to um, a professional performance and uh, sonata for amateurs. On the contrary, uh, I think that the, the concert, the, the concerto situation uh, was uh, often for amateurs who had some group of friends or, or family uh, parents for, uh, for playing. Uh, and uh, the sonata is something very useful for a, for a professional who is touring and plays uh, in these sonatas here and there without great... Uh, and so uh, this is confirmed by this uh, research because uh, we have so many cadenzas in, uh, in the sonatas. And uh, I, I think the next step could be uh, interesting also to see where uh, places in the sonatas are uh, possible for cadenzas, but maybe only uh, signed by a um, corona, how, to, how do you say, a, a fermata. Uh, there are some places for possible cadenzas, but not written. This may be also an interesting uh, supplement to this uh, research. Don't think if you found something like this. If, if I may just respond quickly yes. off the cuff. Um, I know, for example, in the, like I had mentioned in the first Pembroke collection that's in the British Library, there are almost no opportunities. Maybe one if I missed. In the second Pembroke collection that's in Leipzig, almost all of them have the extreme majority, yeah. except there are sorry, there are 14 sonatas, three duos that's specifically for gamba and cello. None of those have opportunities for a cadenza. The, of the 11, gamba's truly written solos, a gamba's solo. Three of them have written cadenzas Eight have places, maybe seven. Uh, yeah. The majority have places. Mm -hmm. In terms mm -hmm. of, for example, Hama. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't also, I didn't even think of this. This is very, very wonderful. In terms of uh, Haydn writing for Nicholas Esterhazy, there are tons of places for, for cadenzas. Th there's more places for cadenzas to be improvised. Or who knows what he was doing, but that Haydn didn't write. Um, I, these are in uh, Elster's hand, so these 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 trios aren't in Haydn's hand; um, they're in his copyist's hand. But there are more cases where even Nicholas Esterhazy would have improvised a gamba cadenza, or at least it's not indicated. I don't know if he had Kwan's Kwan's next to him or something his Borgi that he was playing from. But um, in in Mozart too, the majority have places. It's interesting. The majority of sonatas that I've seen do have them. Um, the Matan collection, uh, I'm trying to think offhand of, of all of them, but just thinking about Abel and Haydn, 
there are more places where uh, cadences can be improvised mm -hmm. than are 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 not. And and um, I didn't I did, of course did not mean to imply that that concertos are are uh, more this this separation. Um, but that's a very very interesting point. I will have to to think about it. Yes, it should be a, a complementary to your yes. research of where, okay. it, where it is written and where it, it is suggested but not written. Okay. Yes, thank you. The, the, just last, there are, there are many places where it's suggested, so I'll have to. Didn't even think, didn't even consider consider those, but that'll be the next uh, catalog. I have a question. Um, so, do, do you can you tell us a little bit? Do you, uh, or do you know? Do you know when the the uh, tradition of providing cadences began and um, is there a uh, scope for providing uh, so-called cadences in earlier repertory? We have been looking at very late repertory relatively uh, in the, uh, the Gamba literature, but for example, uh, top of my head, say the unaccompanied Fantasias of Telemann where you get little sections, um, for example, in the first, very first Fantasia in C minor, you've got C minor, yeah. sort of, uh, a, a slow opening section, and it stops, and then it starts. There's a there's a, a different section. Are those places possible for cadenzas of some kind of improvisation? But I'm also interested to know when this tradition. Uh, began thank you that's really really a wonderful question and i will do my best to stay on topic uh in terms of specifically the telemon fantasias and generally i i didn't include them i did think about them and i've played them and I, they're wonderful pieces it's difficult for an unaccompanied piece to be a cadenza i i, I don't know of any offhand it's it starts to 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 create to enter the territory of well what is a cadenza and I still haven't found that answer and it's even for example we're looking at the sources it's it's I have a hard time uh, saying what to include and what not to include and the practice I'm not I, I'm sure there are people in this Zoom chat much more qualified to talk about this than I am but the practice comes from of a cadence you would hold a cadence before piece ends and you would improvise and the, the practice kind of became more ornamented and, and flourished as time went on. But sorry, so that 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 goes back to what Bettina was uh, saying earlier on, um, in the sense that um, so far, what we've, we've been looking at are um, examples at the end of pieces, but um, is there scope for providing a similar kind of improvisation earlier on, if a similar kind of cadence occurs, say in the dominant key, because often a piece will have, say, two sections in binary form, and both will have a sort of a, a cadence before before it ends. So say if you have in the A section a similar kind of cadence, would, would you provide a cadence there as well? Maybe uh, a less substantial one than at the very end. I mean, I, I don't know, is that, that sort of thing? Well. I I can only answer that, that I don't know of. Interestingly, Quantz actually um, talks about the origin of cadences, but he, I, I forget exactly what he says, but it's in this chapter 15. Um, he says that they came a generation or so ago. He says there, I, I won't say any what he says, I don't remember exactly offhand, but he talks a little bit about it. Um, I think you could take th those those spaces in terms of final cadences for for repetition. Um, I think it depends a lot on on taste, to be honest. I don't have a source or or experience to tell you. Um, but to put, to put it to put it bluntly, should we be doing something whenever we see a fermata in the music? I, I think <laughs> I don't want to speak in general general terms. I mean, if it's a piece that has Format is constantly like if it's some sort of like in a lyrical text sense. Maybe I think why not? I mean I wouldn't I wouldn't scoff at it. I again I have never seen them written out like that. 
um i think i think the practice for me these written cadenzas are the exception not the norm and i think the amount of ornamentation and and um improvisation that they that that was done um i will briefly make a quick detour i'm working on 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 another another research project that's i won't talk too much about it because it will come out soon it's um secret secret yes but in the, this is the piece that has uh two cadenzas in it so there's actually one place where there is a cadenza at the second uh for the, at the end of the a section and the piece is incredibly actually interesting I will only uh, no. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna give any more of who it is. Um, but the 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 piece has an uh, the version similar to like the the Telemann methodical sonatas where there's the version and then an ornamented version. And it's. I mean, if you look at it, it's it turns from some notes to just black, just ink. Um, so I think it's a matter my answer that I'm struggling to, to, to get to is it's a matter of taste to a large degree. I think as long as it's, I think it should be in relation in terms of duration to the piece if the cadenza is longer than the piece itself. But again, that's my taste. So Luke's trying to get in. Yeah, oh. I just have one um, suggestion to add about the baritone trios by Haydn. I think in a lot of the places he puts Fermata's to give time for the baritone to stop resonating if it's on the wrong harmony for the end of the phrase. So I think some, some of those are specifically for that purpose, because some of those instruments can ring on for 20 minutes. You can swig a cup of tea whilst you're waiting for the <laughs> harmony to go away. But um, yeah, just one little thought about that. Thank you. That's actually uh, very helpful. I never, never thought of that. And if you had nice headphones like I luckily do you could hear when Luke was playing the resonance of that baritone was yeah you know um massive so that's uh very very helpful I I know there are I'll, I I won't speak off the cuff I'll have to look through some of the Haydn again and see there are definitely places where there are fermatas um I just want to add another point because I've just thought about this but Cadenzas became such a uh, a thing, um, and it, it it grew and grew and became so long and uh, and written out that they be they became separated from the main from the main piece, didn't they? I mean, I'm thinking of Locatelli, um, who wrote I think they're called Caprices at the end of his Concerti. And th th you, you can actually isolate them. And I think Paganini may have taken, got his idea for his caprices from uh, uh, examples by Locatelli. Um, so I, I just wanted to also ask you earlier, uh, how, what's, what do you think about the length of cadenzas that we should be providing? Looking at the examples that you, you came across, um, what sort of length are we looking at if we were to sort of improve? Device our own cadenzas. Well, luckily, I can very give a very safe an answer first. Quantz does address this. He says for a flute player or a wind player, it should be one breath. And if a string player is quite imaginative or creative or contrapuntally strong, longer. Um, so, okay, that's not that's not a time. You can't look at the clock and say one breath. Of course, I think. Like I had mentioned, it's earlier in the 18th century. So, like you very, very accurately said, as time goes on, they become longer and longer. And a cadenza in Beethoven or even for mm -hmm. a Brahms concerto, or those time period are much, much more. Usually, the pieces are longer, the movements are longer. It's in terms of duration. I, I, I mean, it's again slightly taste, but there mm -hmm. are sources who say, in well, I mean. It's not science, it's music, it's art, it's all taste mm. in the end, but there are sources that say shorter is generally better, but if you can do longer, fine. There are some that say um, they've modulated so far from the home source, I can't even, I don't know where I am. And then there are some like Borgi that are 
sometimes quite imaginative, and, and if you look through, there are some that move quite far away. Um, I, I can, it's hard to, to, to speak so broadly, um, but it depends on when I would, when, where in history the piece, the piece is, and how you're feeling that day, how imaginative <laughs> you are in this performance. But I, I would say if it starts to rival the duration of the piece, it's, uh, maybe a little long. I would suggest that the examples that you, you've provided us today give us some exemplars. They're all short, I mean, relatively short, aren't they? All, all the, the, both the ones you've played and the, the manuscripts you've shown us. Um, if, if they were measured by the speed of the adagio, they're, they're sort of no more than eight bars long, roughly. Um, and I would have thought that would, that would give you some sort of overall clue. What I was going to ask was whether you, you were in a position or whether you have done a sort of analytical taxonomy of the cadenzas to, to suggest the main structures that you see in them and the, the, the sort of types of music that composers are writing um, within them. For instance, so, so many of them seem to have arpeggios as the basis, or you pointed out the descending bass line idea. Um, it would be possible to build up a little sort of vocabulary of, of techniques to use in, in cadenzas, which we could then, as it were, learn and apply when we're making them up ourselves. Is that something you've done or, or proposed to do? I, you know, I, I will say, I've been saying this, this, I really love this question because it's exactly the way this project came about where I was just notating little figures. To me, it was an attempt at like machine learning where, uh, okay, you have arpeggios going up or, you know, this triplet figure, this, this, and this. There's the, the vocabulary and, and when I made this this talk, the way the, the it was structured at the beginning, an old draft, it, it was more on a comparison of the different languages and the different um, things you see overlapped. If you looked, if one were to, on a rainy day, play all the Borgia cadenzas, you could, it, I would say it like this, if you put it in a machine, an AI learning, it could spit out, if you have these, these uh, features, it could spit out Cadenders and you couldn't distinguish them from the body. So, what what you need is an 18th century Ganassi, you know, who compiled all this different <laughs> yeah. you know, different examples of you know, embellishments that you can then use to, <laughs> yes. for a, a cadenza or a particular movement. Even absolutely, I will just to to respond to what you said in the beginning. A lot of these are short. My personal taste and what I've read, which is the taste of others, tends to err on the side of short. There is one cadenza that comes to mind um, that I, it was originally had its own slide, but unfortunately because of time restraints, I had to. Um, it's the, the Sperger's hand of the Von Hall, also that we only have that concerto in his hand. And it's the bass concerto, like I said, he quotes the principal theme and it's quite long. It's hefty, but I, I think Daria is in this and I, uh, she's, really the person to talk to about Sperger. If I remember, it was, f he wrote it specifically for a, a performance where he was trying to get a court position. So there are these extra musical things that are influencing these cadenzas. It's, it's very difficult to say. I, I think generally they are shorter, but there are instances, like I had said, if you say, well, cadenza should be this way, it's very easy for me to say, oh, wait, what, what about this one? I have this exception, so. Speaking generally to contradict my contradiction, they are generally shorter than longer. Oh, thank you very much. I'm uh, still waiting to see if anyone else has any questions. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, you showed us a picture of Hammond's vial, the original vial. Do you know um, who made it originally? What was the model? Shadowman. Sorry? Stadelman. It's a Stadelman vial. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Sorry, was that Jackie? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't Yeah, and a it's, surface It's the same Stadelman that built uh, the baritone that Prince Estahazi had. Yes. Oh, okay. But a seven string as well. It's a seven string. Uh, can, can you show us a close up of it? Yeah. I'll try. It has a little little guy in a hat, um, on the on the scroll. It's a shame they don't allow you to play it. 
I mean, it is was, it not in playing condition? Is that why? It was played by... So it was... I will just say I'm having the instrument, an exact copy of the instrument built. So... Oh, wow. And in the future, one may ask and, of course, use the vial and play it as close as we can get to his vial. It's being built by Shem Mackey, who... Um, it, it, it is a shame. It was restored in, I think, 2004, and Thomas Fritsch was involved and played the vial. He told me the strings were a little bit narrow, so it was difficult to play, but it had a very beautiful sound. Um, it is a shame. It's it's it, uh, but of course it's a shame it can't be played. But on the flip side, anyone can go see it, and and it's in the lobby. Well, you go upstairs in the museum, and it's there, and it's very very beautiful instrument. If anyone is in the north of Germany in Schwerin, uh, I recommend it's one of my favorite cities. But also recommend trying to visit the vial in these instruments. Sorry, in these manuscripts. Oh, I didn't share the photo. I'm sorry. I thought I, I I was looking at the. Sorry, I didn't I didn't click the share button. Okay, this is the vial. I'm sorry. I I, I forgot to switch back. So <laughs> okay, that makes more sense. Here's the scroll. You can see what I was talking about. The man in the hat. The bow is interesting. Is the bow part of the instrument? Is the bow, the bow is the bow original? So that's, no, that is a violin bow. Well, it's a very light bow. Uh, and the way the bow is worn away, it was held overhand. Uh, so most likely, it was a violin bow. Either that, and we know Hamel was a cellist. He played Haydn's concertos. There's a, a, a newspaper from Press, the Pressburger Zeitung, I think in 1798, I, I forget the year. But it talks about him debuting one of his own concertos. Like, it, it, so we know he was a cellist and also a very good one. We know the, the pay stubs from his some of his positions uh, in Bratislava of Pressburg, and he was paid more than double the other cellists. So he was quite good. Um, so the, the, he played. Was that his bow? I don't think so. I my personal opinion is when the the um, the instruments and everything was moved from Ludwigslust, where they were, to where it is now in Schwerin. A bow got, you know, someone who was moving maybe made a mistake and, and put the wrong bow, or maybe the bow broke and they stuck a bow. Or maybe he did really use an incredibly light bow and played overhand. I don't know. I can't say. But So, Nick, um, if uh, for your next session, if we were to invite you again, would you do a follow-up entitled How to Make Your Own Cadenza? Because I think we all <laughs> we all were dying, we all itching to try <laughs> to try and make up our own cadenzas now. Uh, I, I, I would <laughs> absolutely love to, and and I hope that's that's exactly where I wanted everyone to be. Just I, I I am no the point of this lecture was in no way to to put my own um, uh, ideas. I, I wanted to be as removed from the process. I can't help myself if I really like a city or, or a piece. I, I have to say it. I apologize, but I, I wanted to make the resources for for available for everyone, um, and to show to the list and the other sources. Um, I would love to do something like that. That would be wonderful. Um, and I'm sorry I didn't in this talk. It, it just in in 50 minutes. I, I talk a lot, and I had a hard time. Um, uh, sorry, I would I would love to do something like that, um, but just to say that this this talk was more to give the burning desire for everyone to look at these sources and uh, I, uh, the first thing I, the the Borgi I cannot recommend enough on a rainy day to read through the Borgi and the cadenza list will provide so much insight and I think my biggest hope is to where you end up knowing even less and to just to have even more possibilities and to have even more questions and and there are some some uh, for example um, artistic things the Italian words that Borgi writes huh so uh, yeah this, this uh, I hope everyone is is enjoys having access I, I will also say there are a few further readings that I have um, not on cadenza writing but on the manuscripts and and the course and and some of this music. Um, for example, uh, there's an article in the American Gamba Society by David Rhodes, 
called the Viola de Gamba, its repertory and practitioners in the late 18th century. Uh, it's a great read. He's very, very nice. Um, in terms of Haydn, anything by H.C. Robbins Landon is gold and amazing. Um, the Haydn Chronicles and works. Uh, Michael O'Loughlin's book that I recommended earlier, um, Frederick the Great and his musicians, uh, the Villa de Gamma music of the Berlin School, very well documented, and the one of the most important books um, is Fred Flassig's Die Solista Gamben Musik im 18. Jahrhundert. Uh, it's in German, but it talks about, it's an attempt, really a massive catalog and part of my inspiration to Okay, gamba music in the eighth, solo gamba music in the eighteenth century. It's 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 none of these will are on um, how to cadenza cadenza in, but they are sources and windows into some some sources. Sorry, sources into the practices that that can be applied personally for learning. Well, thank you very much, Nicholas Kleinman. So, um, and thank you to you all for attending tonight's session and I look forward to seeing you again in the next session. We're going to take a break in October because there is a live meeting in Edinburgh. I hope uh, uh, whoever uh, is in reach will be able to come to that meeting and I hope to see you in November. In the meantime, stay safe, keep well and keep playing. Thank you very much everyone. Bye-bye.